Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you today? I'm doing good, Bruce. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I see a little tiny, tiny bit of kind of blue in the gray today in that sky. Maybe things are starting to brighten up. That did cheer me up a little bit. It's been awfully <laughs> gray. gray. I mean, it's one thing to have to put up with our winters, but if it's also gloomy out yeah. and you're and we're all confined because of the, you know, the latest round of protecting our, ourselves and our society from the dread COVID, uh, it, it, it can start to beat down in on every individual. We're all feeling it. So we carry on. Keep calm and carry on. Uh, Bruce, speaking of keeping calm, carry on. It looks like the NHL and their players are going to have to do that if they're not going to inf- infuriate every surviving last surviving hockey fan on earth with a some kind of labor dispute right now which i think would be the most ridiculous and stupid and obtuse and tone deaf move that any sport could engage in but they'll probably do it anyway we'll talk about that uh let's talk about we'll, we'll talk about our further uh viewings of canadian uh or, excuse me edmonton Oilers players in europe you had a good close look at Gate Tan Haas's recent games. We're also going to talk about two U.S. college prospects, both big right shot D-man prospects, Mike Kesselring of Northeastern and Phil Camp of Yale or Harvard. What is he, Harvard or Yale? Yeah, yeah. Yale. 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 Um, both lower round draft picks of the Edmonton Oilers, and you had a look at Kemp's games from last year, and I had, I had a look at Kesselring's games from last year. So we, but we haven't viewed, I have, you haven't viewed Castle Ring and I haven't viewed Camp. So we, the, it'll be kind of a, more of a description from one, from one or the right. other of us of either of these players. Mm-hmm. Alrighty, let's start out with the, uh, we'll also talk about Craig Ellingson's post. Um, journal uh, editor Craig Ellingson did a post on Oilers hockey sweaters and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. So Bruce, uh, what's the latest in the NHL, NHL, PA wrangling over a new season? Well, barring something haven't changed this morning, it sounds like the uh, two sides are at odds about uh, uh, the owner's request to revisit the agreement that was signed just earlier this year and the return to play and the, the new CBA that was signed, uh, uh, what was it, July? I mean, it was not that long ago. And the, uh, uh, the deal was signed in order to get the players back and playing, which they did, and, they, you know, they... They played out the long playoff series. I think they got one paycheck. And the players took a couple of hits in terms of uh, this upcoming year's pay. Uh, a, uh, a clawback, or there's some, there's some smoother word for deferral. Uh, and then an escrow, um, raising the escrow rate to 20%. And the players agreed to those things. And for whatever reason, the owners never thought in terms of the season coming up would be anything other than 82 games. I honestly don't know what they were thinking. But the, the agreement was that players would be paid, you know, that full amount minus the 28% that they would give back through these uh, deferral and escrow uh, arrangements. And when I say give back, I mean put back in the pot to be eventually split 50-50 over, over time. And now the owners have come back with uh, uh, some newer uh, demands. According to uh, to um, Elliot Friedman, who writes under this headline, players feeling angry, betrayed by NHL's new CBA amendment proposals. And uh, remind you, CBA that was signed just a few months ago. And uh, Elliot says players agreed to a 10% of deferral and escrow caps or 20% and then lowering over the years to come. And now the league has submitted two new proposals asking for changes to the upcoming season, uh, wanting deferred compensation to go from 10 to 25 percent and escrow from, uh, sorry, 10 to 20, and escrow from 20 to 25. And then there was a second one that just wanted the deferred compensation to be raised to 26 percent. These are all, of course, just numbers, but numbers that are real dollars that add up in, in, in time. And the players are not happy, you know, seeing that. You know, they, they think they made some sacrifices to uh, come to terms in July. This is November. 
And the landscape obviously has changed. Uh, I would suggest that the owners probably coughed up the puck when they uh, when they didn't have any kind of proration built into the 2021 20, uh, part of the agreement. And some of the owners, apparently there's a group of about five to eight owners who say they would rather not play at all than go ahead and play the 2021 season under the current agreement. Yeah. What we have at this point, unlike baseball, where they really had a showdown where it looked for a long time that there wouldn't be a season at all and certainly had a delayed start while they while they argued about it, both sides do want to play for the most part, other than that handful of owners. But there, there's probably some middle ground here, and ultimately they're dividing 50% of hockey-related revenues. And the question is how quickly do the pay, players get their share how far the curved head of the curve do they get? And how will they have to pay it back over the subsequent years? And that's uh, you know that'll differ for individual players. It's a very different equation for a 34-year-old guy with a year left in his career to a 21-year-old who's just breaking into the league. So there's uh, there's uh, going to be to some extent players arguing among themselves about the, you know the different different uh, impacts that uh, varying scenarios will have. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of different reactions to this whole thing, like the squabbling of millionaires and billionaires mm-hmm. on one level over over money is, uh, it's hard for me to feel sympathetic to, 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 to either side. At mm-hmm. the same time, they're in a business where they're see, seeing catastrophic drops in, in, in income. Players mm-hmm. have very short careers. You know, we people get their noses out of joint. Well, the guy's making five million a year or four million a year. Some of them are. Some of them are, most of them aren't. And the ones who are, that only happens for a short window of time where they have this opportunity to make this money. They're at the, they're at the top of a very, very steep pyramid in terms of um, achievement, performance, and they deserve to be paid well based on the interest of the fans. Their problem is that they all face is that the interest of fans uh, can't be expressed in dollars right now because people can't go to the rinks. And right. in the foreseeable future, that will be the case. And their other problem is, Bruce, people are going to start losing interest in NHL hockey. And, um, you know, everything we do in life is habit. And if we get out of the, if people get out of the habit of caring about hockey, watching hockey, going to hockey games, spending that money, if they get into other habits, who says they're going to come back to hockey? I think they're, they're in, in a grave, grave risk of losing 10 to 20 percent of their fans forever. Just gone. They're not coming back. And I think that they all realize th- this. And it, you know, so I don't blame the players for being really upset. In, and I, I'm not actually that interested in the details right. of their squabble right now. Maybe one day I'll start to, to focus on it a little bit. I mean, it just seems kind of beside the point right now when we're dealing with a, a COVID uh, pandemic. But I understand them being, I understand the players being really upset by this and and, and losing money. But they, they also have in hockey this great framework, this 50-50 framework. I think if they can all keep that in mind as the basis that they're in a partnership now with the owners, the owners are in a partnership with the players, it's 50-50. The whole idea is making as much money as you can so that 50% is bigger for the players and bigger for the owners. Right. If they can keep that as their focus, and I think mm-hmm. that they will, I think they will keep mm-hmm. that as their focus and keep the squabbling to a minimum and this might take the players realizing, hey, the owners thought they were going to make more. They thought there was going to be fans in the stands. There isn't. This is right. a, a, it's not unforeseeable. Uh-huh. Uh, it's not an unforeseeable turn of events, but maybe a bit, you know, maybe you go back to the 50-50 thing and say, okay, we'll take our 50. Let's figure out how to take our 50 in a way that's acceptable to the players. And we'll go from there. We'll take our 50%. Well. And they're, I mean, they're looking at 50% over the life of the CBA. And I mean, in the year that's coming up, the players might get as much as 70 or 80%, according to Frank Saravalli, who's another uh, 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 voice in this uh, that uh, gave, gave a strong description on Low Tide's radio show uh, uh, a couple days ago. And he also covers, of course, for uh, TSN. And the thing is, I mean, there's so many... You can follow. I mean, some are signed long term contracts and they deliberately set the year to year terms of the contract based on how the 
agreement said that the uh, uh, the escrow would would go down over the years. So they, they, they actually use that to help structure their contract. You also have other players whose contracts are structured in such a way that almost all of their money is play, paid in bonus money. And how that relates to escrow and deferral is a different equation than salary. I mean, Connor McDavid, for example, in 2021, he makes $14 million, which includes a $1 million base salary and $13 million in bonuses. You know, and then on the other hand, you have, say, a young guy coming in like Caleb Jones, just signed a, a deal for $850,000. Well, he's already losing 28%. Now they're turning around and saying more. Like, he's not a millionaire, right? Lots of them aren't millionaires. And, and so, I mean, I understand that there's a, a little little bitterness, but the real world's going to step in. I mean, the real eco economic world is going to rear its ugly head at, uh, at some point. And the least thing they can any of them afford to do is kill the goose that's laid the golden eggs to this point. Listen, if they start to bitch too much about losing, you know, if you're still making three, four, five million, ten million a year or whatever it is, and you and you come out as this strident, you know, no, you know, labor guy, like I'm not taking a penny, people are not going to, that's not going to go over well. And we'll see if that happens uh, because people are out of work. They're f fearful of being unemployed. This is just a terrible time okay. for the economy. And, and they, 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 better, they better be very sensitive about the, the feelings of the fans here because people, mm -hmm. listen, it gets too strident. I'm going to tune out. I'm not going to listen to this BS from anybody whining about that kind of thing from pro athletes. Just here's the market. Do what you can to keep the market alive and move forward and and. I don't want to hear your complaints. Like oh, oh, that's pro, kind of my my knee jerk reaction is that well, pro pro owners as well. I mean, they, yeah. I mean, cash flow is one issue for them, and it may have changed drastically this year. On the other hand, there are the owners of these franchises, who's even as they're splitting hockey related revenue, the value of the franchises has just been going up, 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 up. And you know, an investment that a guy bought, you know, ten years ago. Let's say Daryl Cates, what he paid for the Oilers versus what their book value is now. I mean, it's it's just a huge difference. So there's there's arguments on both sides. Hopefully they're quick arguments, and hopefully most of them are kept under wraps, because now we're at the point where there's not a lot of room for a, a big negotiation if they have any hope of getting the schedule underway when they say they want to, which is January 1st, which may be unrealistic for other reasons. We'll see, but. Uh, Getting tied up in, in in nasty negotiations is not the look that anybody needs at this point. It'll actually be interesting to see the valuation of the teams in light of uh, COVID, because Forbes should be coming out with its new list uh, fairly soon here. Yep. And we'll see um, how much the paper value of these teams. I mean, it's always a paper value because it's estimated, right. and until you sell it, you don't really know what it's worth. But it, you're right, Bruce. Like it, Kate's franchise has gone up from what did he buy it for? Two hundred million can't remember exactly the number and it, and it's gone up to the paper value went up to in, in the, it doubled at least uh, doubled, to yeah. Forbes. so i think it was i think it was 480 at some point if i'm not mistaken so yeah this is millionaires and billionaires fighting between the, between each other over over money and i, I think people's patience fans often have very little patience for this kind of discussion mm -hmm. but i think the the patience for right now versus about this much like it's zero yeah. like uh, well, they, they i don't do know how have, you feel about it but that's my i don't i don't want to hear about it and think about it like make a deal and shut up yeah they do have the example of baseball to not follow because baseball kind of made an ass of itself in the process of uh, some extensive public wrangling last year and that's the last thing this league needs especially with its past history of wrangling and lockouts and work stoppages and so on i said to you ages ago the league cannot afford another work stoppage uh they've already had their work stoppage for the 2020s and it's basically ongoing as we speak it's all the delays and so on of the COVID crisis and so they're going to have to work it out we thought NBA, and now the one of the sides wants to change the terms so you know, it's like the American election. Even when it's over, it's not over. So, <laughs> not well, look at the ratings that. for, you know, in terms of losing fans, Bruce, look at the ratings for pro sports across the board. Uh, all kinds of hit. different enterprises took a massive, massive hit. 
just seems if people can't go to the games, it's not the cultural phenomenon um, that it that it has previously been. It doesn't fulfill that role for us. Uh, it's just not quite as exciting, or or maybe just people just are the Netflix shows are so good right now that uh, that's capturing our attention. Uh, Bruce, let's Queen's, talk a little bit. Go Queen's ahead. Gambit. Gotta, yeah, that's gotta right. love it. <laughs> I've been watching Barber, and I like those kind of series. I, I love Vikings, and uh, Barber is pretty damn good too. And it's based on a true story, as mm-hmm. is Vikings, but Vikings. But I don't know how uh, close Barber is. I know that Vikings wasn't very close, but these are kind of legendary stories anyway. From uh, that Vikings was based on. Uh, anyway, first let's talk about um, Gaetan Haas to start with. Uh, We've both seen him play. When you see him in Europe, um, he he plays a bigger role on his team. He's more special teams guy, power play and uh, shorthanded. Uh, you saw three games. What was your what's your main takeaways on Gaetan Haas right now? Yeah, I saw three games playing back at home in Switzerland, where he'd already played ten seasons in the National League before he came to the Oilers last year at age 27. So he's very comfortable and in his element on the big ice in the, you know, the league that he knows. And he's playing about 18 minutes a night. He's listed as being on the second line on that team, but he's the second line guy that does everything. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. He was on the power play. Sometimes he was on the point. Sometimes he was uh, up front. He was on the penalty kill. He was in three on three in overtime. He's on the four on three or three on four in overtime other games he was on six on five or five on six with the goalie out at the end of the game like he was out in key situations of all sorts and including penalty kill whereas on the orders last year he was strictly a five on five guy and strictly a you know a usage in 10 minutes. he you know what i'm seeing here is a player who's capable of doing more at least at a lower level league and uh, he, uh, the, the Swiss League is roughly the, the same level as the American Hockey League. So there's that. They're, you know, they're, their NHL equivalency is almost the same. So I, I use that as sort of my, my, my measure of which league is better than that league or the same. And so it's about that level. But man, oh man, can that guy ever skate? Oh. And he just yeah. skates and skates all night long. Like he came out, I watched the last three games that he played, and he came out flying right out of the gate in game one, and he just kept on flying for the three games. It's not just the sheer speed, which is, is evident every time he takes the puck into the neutral zone, but also the, the agility and the ability to change direction. And, to, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's got nice edges, and he's, you know, he's very elusive. So it's not just foot speed, but it's... Uh, uh, they have real trouble containing the guy, and he could hold the puck uh, along the boards. Mind you, this is wide ice boards. This is not NHL boards with Zadino Chera pinning you against them. Uh, I saw one sequence where he held, he played keep away for 15 seconds, where he had the puck on the stick for 15 seconds. And in the games that I saw, he 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 had a scoring slump to start the year, but he scored two goals and two assists in these last three games. And was quite a dominant player in the last one where he was in on all three of Burns' goals in a 3-2 win. And he's he's really, you know, I think he's going to hit the he's going to hit the ice skating fast when they do get to training camp here. And this is a whole whole advantage of these guys going over to Europe and playing games. He's going to be ready to roll. So he's competing with Juder Kara, and they're very different hockey players. I think Haas personally is a much better player at this point in his career than, than Jujar Kara is. Much more consistent, faster, and most importantly, defensively. You, you need your b- bottom line players to be sound defensively. Uh, Jujar, as a center, as a, just struggles with that. Like he, he struggles advancing the puck out on a stick. He sometimes struggles covering the defensive slot, knowing who to cover. And these are things that Haas, I find, is not just okay at. He's really good at those things. He's a very smart defensive player from everything I see. He just knows who to who to cover, where to cover in the defensive slot. And when he gets the puck on a stick, he usually makes a good play with it, either carrying it or passing it. So I don't actually, personally, I, I don't think it's close. And it, and it's funny, as you were talking about Haas ragging the puck 
and all the things he can do. A, a certain player came to mind, and I don't know if it's just popped into your head as well, but, you know, going to the, the great code, you know, with the 1980 Oilers informing all of my views on hockey, and I'm looking to rebuild that team in my head all the time. I right. see Haas, I've seen Haas, you know, just in the McTavish role a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that third line center who, who's got a little bit of offensive game, who can kill penalties by raying the puck, and uh, is a very smart player. Now he's got to, Haas has got to get better on faceoffs. Yep. And sure does. He's he's going to have to play with more confidence, and um, he's going to have to like stick in a little bit more, if that's the right word. Like you know, he he's going to get his foot in there, as they say in soccer. Be a little bit sharper at the point of attack in the NHL, more confident. And and you mentioned he got knocked down about once a period or once a game in the Swiss league, and he's not a big guy. So he yeah. is going to, he's just going to have to, he, it's almost like he's got a, you know, like so many of the players to, to make it in the NHL, he's going to have to up that intensity and ferocity just a little bit. Uh, but otherwise I think everything's there. And I, I really am bullish. Uh, I'd love to see, like if Turris and Haas are your third and fourth line centers, maybe that you got something going on on your team. Cause those are two pretty good players. I believe I haven't watched Turris recently though, but uh, I think Haas is a pretty good player. Yeah, uh, well, you mentioned Craig McTav- McTavish, uh, and they do have that bit in common. McT was great at ragging the puck and, and, and phenomenal at the stops and starts along the wall. And, you know, when someone yeah. cut him off, he'd just turn and go the other way with it. And ha- I saw a little bit of this out of Haas, but at a, at a at a at a higher rate, you know, in terms of moving his feet and, and uh, just just uh, I mean, his uh, his agility is central to uh, to his game. And I'll tell you what, I mean, he's one of those guys, his skating is good enough that any line that he's on is going to be a fast line because he's on it. And we saw some of that last year. The Oilers did have more speed in their bottom six because of guys like him and Egard and Archibald that uh, that Holland brought in. And of all those guys, I mean, Haas is, uh, Haas is I don't know if he's the fastest, but I would say he's he's maybe got the, the, the most... Uh, uh, sort of combined skating talent, four-way skating, that sort of thing. So he's he he's very smooth skater. Nigard's probably the fastest, but just think if you Nigard. had a, a fourth line of Nigard, Haas and Archibald. It's not a big line. That is a fast checking line and those guys work. Those guys all dig in and they're all smart hockey players. So I you know mm-hmm. I I'd love to see that kind of combination out there. I don't know if we're gonna. I mean, but um, you know, they might want to work Alex Chase on in there some somehow. But uh, yep. the owners have some options, Bruce, on their bottom line this year and the, mm-hmm. and their third line, and it's it's uh, mm-hmm. it's fantastic to see. All right, um, Mike Castlering. Uh, I watched three of his games from late last year, mm-hmm. and uh, we're starting to see all these prospect defensemen. I'm starting to get a sense of them. And um, who who can play, who can't play. Now we're just getting brief views of each one of them, and in different leagues of ability. So always have those are two big caveats in terms of our own analysis and what I'm saying right now. So always keep that in the back of your head that I could be wrong, and I know that I could be wrong because it's kind of a distorted lens that I'm looking through right now at all of these players, and and I understand that. So. But I'm just going to base all that said. I'm just going to say what I'm seeing right now. And right. Kesselring, I think, is in the higher rung of defenseman prospects on the Oilers. I don't place him in the same place as Broberry and Evan Bouchard at the very top right. of that list. Philip Broberg, as we call mm-hmm. him. Mm-hmm. Broberry is the Swedes call him. But Kesselring is is he's in the next. He's definitely in the next group. And also in that next group, uh, I think, is Theodor Lenstrom, who's 26 mm-hmm. right now. And it's so in right. a different category because, again, he's older. Mm-hmm. Kesselring is 21, I believe. And he played his first year this year. He's 21. He was 20 mm-hmm. last year. He played yeah. his first year at Northeastern. And so I watched him as he was a, a 20-year-old rookie in that league. And Bruce, he's a hockey player. He just is a hockey player. He competes. Um and this is what I would say separates him a little bit from players like Marcus Niemelainen that I'm seeing and and um, and Philip uh, Berglund or Berglund, as the Swedes call him. Mm-hmm. Kesselring just goes harder. He just battles harder. Everything he does is just, he's not, he doesn't have 
the high level of skill of Evan Bouchard passing the puck or of Philip Broberry skating. That's not, but he's not a bad passer of the puck and he's not a bad skater. Like those are, those are things that he's going to have to work on, especially being really slick with the puck. But he reminded me uh, for a comparison of kind of a, a bigger version of Matt Benning, kind of a kind of, you know, when Matt Benning first came in, the smart hockey player, kind of tough hockey player, um, can pass the puck, skating's okay. Maybe, you know, betting, betting skating and Kessel ring that, you know, maybe not top drawer, but that's the kind of player we're getting here. Like a really gritty, smart, uh, right shot defenseman. And he's he's six four. I think he's his. Um, I've been in contact a little bit with his dad, Casey. Mm-hmm. We did a podcast with him. I, yeah, I, I think his dad was saying that he's probably up to. He's getting he's getting into the two fifteen range, two twenty range in terms of his uh, his size. Mm-hmm. He's nasty, Bruce. Like he, he Mike, oh, Mike Kesselring can be nasty. <laughs> he can get in there and battle, and I like that. Like he he he's the guy who puts that little bit of when he's taking a guy to the boards. There's a little bit of extra oomph into that mm-hmm. taking you into the boards, and I always like that in a hockey player, especially when he wants to play in the NHL. That's part of the NHL game. So I'm saying right. this guy, if there was a redraft that year, I think he was seventh round, sixth round, seventh round the year he was drafted. Yep. I'm going. He's he's now like at the level of a third or second round pick in terms of a redraft maybe of that year terms of what how i see him mm-hmm. um is he he i don't see him as a lot lower on the on the depth chart than um than dmitry samarukov wow he little he'd be just he'd be below samarukov samarukov's an, an a very very good prospect mm-hmm. so it was mike kesselring uh the orders really did well drafting this player this is under the keith gretzky uh peter shirali um regime and uh, I, th- you know, they'll they'll hit a home run if he makes the NHL, but it looks like there's a chance that that could happen. I see a real NHL potential in this player. Sixth round pick, number one sixty four overall in twenty eighteen. Uh, I saw him in two uh, two development camps, and I was impressed the first time, and more impressed the second time, and saw what I saw as real growth between the two, as you would hope. Uh, his stats are nothing special. Two goals, three assists, minus two in his first year at NC2A, where he was 19 to start the season. Uh, but I don't know that stats are going to tell you the whole story of this guy. And he's still filling into his giant frame. Like, I'm not sure he's going to stop at six foot four either. I think there was talk last year he was six five or six even, and, uh, and still filling out. So, of course, in the Joey Moss Cup, we didn't get the opportunity to see the greasiness at play in three-on-three half-ice hockey. It just wasn't that style of game. But the, he certainly has the kind of frame where he can impose himself physically. And if he's that kind of player, hey, I'm all right with that. You know, you need to have some of that in your roster somewhere. He's not uh, like as... big. He's not like big Bobby Clobber right now. I don't want to overestimate <laughs> it. Like, but by the standards, by the standards of the U.S. college game, he was mm-hmm. one of the more physical players on the ice. So right. I'll I'll say that for now because mm-hmm. you know to to be phys- and then to be physical in the AHL and the NHL is a whole different thing, right? You got to really step up if you're going to play that game. But that's what he's going to have to do if he wants to be a professional hockey player. Uh, continue to to work on that aspect of the game and also improve his his passing, which isn't bad. Uh, they had him on the power play now and then. They had him uh, at the end, by the end of the year. He was he was on the power play now and then. He was killing penalties a lot. He was on for the five on three, so he got a lot of ice time as as a rookie. The coach really trained him, and this is on a quite a few good defensemen. Bruce, uh, I see my time's getting short here. I got a, an uh, interview coming up, but let's let's deal with uh, the very interesting story of Phil Camp, who's mm. at Yale, and uh, they've canceled their season there. Camp's heading into his senior season as a hockey player. Doesn't look like he's going to be playing hockey at Yale this winter. So what's he going to do, and what kind of player are we looking at here? Yeah, that's a big question. I mean, Yale, it's astonishing. Uh, they've played hockey for 125 years in a row, and this is the first time they haven't played hockey uh, since the winter of 1894-95. And uh, this they even was played kind of, it in 1918. They played it in both wars. They played it in the Depression. They played it through everything. 
they always played some hockey in, in each of those seasons. Now I'm not, I haven't looked up exactly how much, but they were they're the longest running continuous program in the United States, and you'd be hard pressed to find many in in Canada, uh, especially given the NHL gave up an entire season along the way, so you can boot out teams like Montreal Canadiens and stuff. Anyway, uh, they're not playing this year. He was set to be the captain in his senior year. Everything was working out nice for him, and now he's still going to school. Uh, but no hockey team and what to do. So he's a, he's in an interesting position. Uh, he may be one of those guys. I mean, he's a U.S. college, American-born U.S. college guy, and we've seen this go sideways on Canadian teams before from John Marino that the Oilers wound up giving away for almost nothing uh, or Adam Fox that the Flames drafted but were never able to convince to come to Canada. Uh and so he may have been in a situation where if he played through till next August, he would become a free agent. Now, all that said, he's a seventh-round draft choice, number 208 overall. So uh, despite his pedigree on the U.S. National Team Development Program, where he even served as captain for a couple of years, uh, he's he's clearly a player of, of high character, leadership skills, all that stuff from everything we've heard about the guy. Watching him play games... Uh, I liked a lot of his game, but I wasn't overly impressed with his skating. And that's a part of the game that, you know, when you get into the pro ranks, uh, you know, you're going to have to beef it up. I mean, he's 21 years old and he's still getting better. Uh, but compared to a couple of the guys that I've been watching, uh, you know, Twinkle Toes on skates that I've been watching over in Europe, uh, his his sort of heavy boots and and just some of the technical you know forward to back and so on stuff that just didn't quite seem quite up to snuff so that that's going to be an issue with this player uh i do think he'd be worth signing and you know given the entry level run to see what he can do with it because you know his uh his backstory is good he's uh, you know he's a uh gold medalist, silver medalist at the at the high world junior levels and, and uh, considered a main part of those teams. Uh, he played, all I saw was his three games, they played in a playoff series to get to the next round of the playoffs and then their season was cut off. So they, they won that series and Kemp was very, very good, uh, especially in game two where he had a goal and two assists. It was like an out-of-body experience for, for him. He sort of rated as a defensive defenseman, but he plays more offense than I expected. On the other hand, his defensive play, uh, I, I was expecting more physicality, and there wasn't really a lot of that. It was just more physical play, or sorry, a contained positional game. And he's uh, uh, at this point an intriguing prospect, and he's facing a decision. You know, from a contract right now, what would he do? Would he take it? And if they did, where would they put him? Because there's no guarantee they have an AHL team to drop this guy into. Uh, and so there's, you know, there's a lot, there's so much uncertainty out there in, you know, the world period, let alone the hockey world. But uh, some people have, you know, reached a, uh, what I call in the headline, an inflection point a little sooner than expected for this, uh, for this guy. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because I've always see, heard of him or thought of him as kind of a rugged defenseman. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the rep. He's going to have to be. He's going to have to be, uh, you know, with that kind of skating. So, you know, the NHL is moving away from that kind of player. So we'll see what happens. Um, I think Kessel Ring skates well enough mm -hmm. for the modern NHL. And, he, and he, I think he's, I, I didn't, haven't seen previous years, but I'm, you know, the story with these big lanky guys like Kessel Ring is they often get a little bit better with, with their skating as it goes along, you know, as they grow into their bodies in their 20s. And, um, and I think that's what we're seeing with with him is uh, an improvement in skill. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward. I'll have to watch some camp games to compare the two because they played at a fairly c comparable level of hockey last year, and that might be an interesting comparison to make. Part of it, I mean, it was opponent and and you know playoff situation and just the style of game they were playing. I mean, this was a three game series where this third game went into double overtime, so they played eleven periods, and uh, uh, Yale uh, outscored. Uh, their opponent six goals to five over those eleven periods, so it was very very low event, uh, at least in terms of, of goal scoring. So maybe the contain game was the game plan. Don't run around out of position, taking runs at guys. You know, keep it, keep the play in front of you, kind of thing. So uh, 
but I'm just saying in those games, he didn't strike me as being an extremely physical player, which is kind of what I was expecting to see. Well, it's interesting. You know, the owners have like they have this plethora of mm-hmm. players that we can keep an eye on. Yep. And again, at the very top, there's these two high draft picks, Bouchard and Brobury. And then then there's this this whole group of players who are kind of separating out as the years go by into different uh, categories. So, you know, there's there's Logason and Sam mm-hmm. Rukov, um, yep. Kesselring and Kemp. There's uh Baron Jones. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, did you say yeah, Baron Jones. Jones. Yeah, Baron I mean, Jones, who are yeah, third, and, fourth, and fifth. So some rounds. of them are the question is who's gonna be the bearers and the Joneses, right? Like who's who of these guys is gonna step up? And, and my sense is there's two guys like uh, of that bottom, you know, maybe three that I would that I'm starting to get a pretty good sense about. And they are um Lenstrom, Castle Ring. And Samarukov, mm-hmm. and between those three guys, I think you're going to get at least one NHL defenseman, maybe two, uh, for the bottom pairing, and that's really good news for the Oilers. I just think all three of those guys can really play hockey, like they're just good hockey players. They're smart hockey players, and uh, they compete. So um, Kemp, Kemp uh, is smart. I didn't say that, but he really is. He's, he he's, is a eh? oh yeah, yeah. Hey, right. captain of Yale University, man. <laughs> Oh, you never know. His, history major. Of course he's smart. <laughs> uh, all right, Bruce. Uh, thanks for talking today. It was uh, good to talk to you as always. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>